uh, <laughs> and I think the movie is spectacular. I watched it already and thought that it was really a great one to bring to us. Um, it's, I know we're a small crowd, but we're a pretty mighty crowd. I was thinking of all the counties that are represented here tonight. We've got Marion, Washington, Nelson, Bullitt, Jefferson, yeah. and Fayette. So a number of counties represented in this room tonight. It seems like maybe everybody's from a different county just to look around the room. So. Um, and I think you all know our mission. Most of you are our close allies. Uh, we are a regional nonprofit, as most of you know. Um, we have a mission of promoting sustainable thinking and sustainable development to create a healthy, safe, and productive future for rural, for rural communities. Our focus is on rural. And as far as we know, there's not too many organizations in the country that really focus on rural. So if you look up sustainability and sustainability organizations, you'll find plenty in more urban areas and in Louisville as well, but not in more rural areas. And we think it's a challenge. Uh, Sister Claire can speak to the challenge even more than I can, um, but I think that it's so essential. So I'm really thrilled that everybody's here. Um, I think the United Nations latest report, which is you know, another one in a series of reports, <laughs> underlines the dire and urgent circumstances that we are in uh, as a planet. And I, I just can't underscore enough that I think that while we are kind of past a tipping point for change of this earth as a result of global warming and uh, poor sustainability practices, we can't give up hope because giving up hope would really be betraying all of the things that we've worked for uh, so far. So we have to stay hopeful. And I think this film is really a nice one for focusing on hope and helping us move forward. But New Pioneers, on a more positive note, has a lot to celebrate tonight. We have a new executive director. Uh, we have an executive director emeritus, and this all is just this very week. And so two amazing women, uh, one who's been our founder, Sister Claire McGowan, and we you know, just can't thank her enough for getting us to this place. Um, and then Whitney Wurzel, who's our new executive director. Uh, she's going to be building upon the foundation, the foundational work of Sister Claire. Whitney is, uh, has worked at Burnham since t 2010, and for the last uh, nine years has been the director of education there at Burnham. Before that, she was um, spreading her wings and being free as a bird as park <laughs> ranger in national parks uh, and state parks around about, and um, came back to Kentucky because of her belief <coughs> in the importance of the rural lifestyle here and in sustaining the rural lifestyle here. So this is a natural progression for her. She graduated, she's a native of Bullock County, and she graduated from the University of Charlotte, University of, I'm sorry, Queen's <laughs> University in Charlotte. Did I say that right? Yeah, you got it. Uh, with a degree in environmental writing. So um, that seems like a pretty uh, important degree and relevant degree to have for this particular job. So we welcome Whitney. We're so thrilled that you're here. Um, and we certainly thank Sister Claire, who's going to be with us um, for the rest of her life. Um, <laughs> no. And hopefully the rest of all of our lives. Mm -hmm. um, but she's going to be with us and actually in a position with New Pioneers as Director Emeritus until uh, April, you know, April or May. So um, we'll be holding her feet more to the fire than maybe she would want us to. <laughs> so um, it's, it's such a great duo to have Whitney and Claire together. So I want to turn this over to uh, Whitney. We, tonight we're going to have the film. We're going to have a panel. We're lucky enough to have some people on the panel who are citizens who have agreed to, to just be on the panel and respond with some of their thoughts. Uh, and then we'll have some, some part audience participation. So I'm going to turn this over to Whitney. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. I appreciate that. And um, I just want to thank all of you for being here this evening. And if you were able to make it out a little earlier for the reception, even more gratitude and appreciation. Um, I This is my fourth day on the job, and I have felt nothing but welcome and encouraged. And um, I am just thrilled to be here. And along with that thrill comes a great honor. So I look forward to learning more about each of you and then working together to move new pioneers ahead. We're going to have a great time and we're going to do amazing things. And I look forward to that. So once again, thank you. Now let me tell you a little more about this film that uh, one of my duties first week on the job was to watch a movie. I thought, well, that was a pretty good deal. <laughs> 
Um, but it was with the understanding that that was part of the research to be able to introduce what you're about to take a look at. Um, so as you know, the film Current Revolution, it is an award-winning documentary um, from director Roger Sorkin and the American Resilience Project. Um, prior to this film, I was not familiar with that organization, so I did a little research and discovered that the American Resilience Project is dedicated solely to telling stories of America's greatest environmental and national security challenges. So sort of the merging point of national security and um, environmental security. And they do that through both film and advocacy. Um, working with community organizations like ours to make this film available, that's only one small example of some of the work they do. Um, one thing that they're sort of celebrated for is that instead of focusing on only the negative aspects of these challenges, um, they inspire action and investment around solutions that build a resilient model for American communities. So that echoes what Ann had said a little bit earlier about hope, which anytime we have conversations related to sustainability and climate change, any chance we get to embed hope with all of those statistics and things that are very, very obvious, um, that sounds like a great form of communication. So I thought that that was neat to learn that about um, the project. And a little more about the film. Um, Current Revolution was released last year, so it's about a year old. And it is the first episode, first and still the most recent episode, in a new film series that tackles the challenge. Okay, listen to these following industries. The challenge of how utility, automotive, technology, and defense industries can work together to help modernize our aging power grid. Which if you know anything about our power grid, it was fine and dandy back in the 30s and 40s, but nowadays it is not fit for anything we need to do. Um, so of course the end goal would be to secure and respond to the needs of users while enhancing environmental performance. So again, balancing the needs of people and environmental sustainability. So in this initial chapter of this, um, of this film series, this one fit focuses mainly on the utilities industry and they utilize a diverse group of voices. I'm so pleased to say, um, Current Revolution, it tells the story of a towering American industry on the edge of collapse. So there's no question that change is inevitable um, but whether it fails, prevails, or adapts, the outcome will profoundly affect us all. So that's what we'll get to thinking about. So enjoy the film as much as I know those of us who have seen it, we have. The first thing that I would have to say is the fact that I am a believer. I believe that God created this world and put that sun out there, in my opinion, for us to take advantage of. For those people in the fossil fuel industry, it is a simple truth that your business is going to go away. It's just a matter of figuring out how to do that without leaving people behind or destabilizing the system. Basically, every utility in this country still adheres to the old business model, which is let's go out there and build big power plants Meanwhile, all their customers want more and more solar energy efficiency and storage. So you have this clash of what customers want and the business model of the past of the utilities. To an average consumer, what they want, they want the light to come on when they flip the switch and they want to be able to pay the bill. You don't really have the appreciation of electricity until you don't have it. We've got to understand that we have a moral obligation. We've got to be very much concerned about who we put into power and decisions about our life. I can get out and march all day long, 
But unless we understand the political process and who we put in office to make the decision, then it's all for naught. The electric power system has been one of the most successful and reliable technological systems that we've developed in the modern age. Well, electricity is almost like air. People just assume it's always going to be there. The system that we've inherited was fine for the 1930s and 1940s, but it's not as resilient as it should be. It's not as smart as it should be. It's not serving people as effectively as it should be. There's vested interest in maintaining that old system, but there's a larger openness to thinking about how can we move to a new grid system that meets the needs of the 21st century. The original grid was designed to allow power to flow in one direction from the generator to the user. And now we've got the need for power to flow in both directions and the utility feels threatened by that. The utility, in this state does not want to advance the solar other than if they own it, but they see solar as a out and out competitor. In six states across the country, power companies are fighting to change the rules. Presented thousands of signed cards from supporters, urging commissioners not to change net metering rates. Shouldn't I have the freedom to put solar panels up on my roof if I want? Isn't that like, shouldn't that be my choice? Should there really be a utility telling me, no, you can't do that? If they keep trying to push that, more and more people are just gonna disconnect from the grid. Disasters that we're seeing, like the hurricane devastation in the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, and other islands, provide us an opportunity to um, completely rethink our energy infrastructure. Firefighters are first responders, so they need to have their communications up and running so that they can take emergency calls and take care of the community. And if their generators are going down and breaking and the grid is not on, you know, that poses a real danger to the community because they can't even call the help that they need. So we just put up a 6.6 .6 kilowatt system here, and it's also connected to some battery storage. So the wonderful thing about that is we are able to make sure this fire station has power 24 hours a day and demonstrate to the leaders in the area and to the community in general that this technology works. You know, that's really gonna save lives at the end of the day. Federal Energy Regulatory Commission says there's nine points of failure in the United States. You take any one of those out, or if they fail, then you could have partial grid collapse. And many of our bases are at the end of the power line. And with the number of grid disruptions going on, if anything happens upstream, we run out of power and we're solely running on diesel generators. If we're able to get them up more rapidly through renewable energy, or if they don't consume as much energy, then we've increased the resiliency of that base. So we're able to serve the communities in which our bases are located. Thank you very much. We don't want to lose these military bases. And so as the military leaders look at bases that need to be closed, one of the questions they're going to be asking is, does the base have its own power? There's a variety of ways, both natural events and ones that are intentional by somebody who wants to do us harm, who can attack that substation down the street or cyber attack. Our goal in the Department of Defense is to be more prepared for the full range. 
not just in natural disasters, but if somebody really intends to mean us harm, it's something we must protect above anything else, ensuring that every American has power every time and all the time when they turn on the lights. We now know that Russia has cyber tools embedded in the U.S. electrical grid and in other areas in, to include in our nuclear power plants, which shows an ability to scale this potentially to a pretty high level. What we're doing today is we're demonstrating uh, this trailer that we've developed. It's for a mobile microgrid training platform. So that way, instead of having to worry about buying all these components yourself or having the know-how to set it up, we've developed the training manuals, the hardware, and put it all together. The nice thing about this is uh, the concept is grid stability. Um, if you're looking at having a, a power generation station miles and miles away and you have a blackout, there could be thousands of things that go wrong in between point A and point B. Now, if you throw something like this on a much larger scale in between point A and point B, you have something to kind of act as a backup, as a stabilizer to the grid. And if we're going to be putting these out there, then they need to know how it's going to interface with their equipment. And there's nothing that's going to stop someone from trying to put one of these on their own property. Renewables can give people the chance of not being tethered to a government-created monopoly. They can have individual liberty to generate their own electricity. Those states that have really intransigent utilities that are saying, we don't want to do renewables, that are pushing back on the right to go solar, those states are going to lose out. Amazon's not going to that state. So go to your elected officials and say, we want those companies here, and we know that they want clean energy, so what are we doing to provide for it? There's an energy revolution going on, including with electric cars. What I would say to the utility monopolies is you need to be supporting the electric car industry because the bottom line is they're burning your electricity and your electrons that you make profit off of. As soon as electricity became central to the health of economies and to the vitality of cities, we decided, you know what? Providing this technology is too important to leave it in the hands of unregulated for-profit companies. And that's why we have public utility commissions that regulate for-profit utility companies to make sure that they're serving the greater public interest while they're making a profit. I'm just gonna read from Psalm 133. Mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. In Christ we pray, amen. amen. The Public Utilities Commission has a huge impact on clean air, on clean water, but most importantly on the amount of money people have to pay the utilities. We've been living with this for years and years and years. And we want a change. Monday, the town hall of Germfask was filled with nearly 100 people to discuss electric costs. What the public is tired of is monthly electric bills costing as much as $1,000. I got a young couple behind me had back-to-back -back $600 plus electric bills. We've got people who actually have a higher utility bill than they do a mortgage on their house. If your public utility commission doesn't have a strategy for building the utility of the future, then demand that they do it. This is a very powerful group of people that sets policies around our livelihood. The 2019 Renewable Energy Development Initiative. All in favor of staff's recommendation, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? So if you want to have a, a balanced public service commission, first of all, know the issues, study the issues, study who's there, study who's retiring, and put somebody in there that will address your issues. You want me to untie the front? Yes, please. You start the end of it? I don't have to go to the governor and ask the governor if I can do such and such. I don't have to go to the legislature and ask them if I can introduce a docket to do this and this, because I'm not appointed by the governor. I'm not elected by the legislature. I have to answer to 10 million people in this state who I have to answer to. 
Plus they don't buy three million vote, but. <laughs> I think when it comes to power companies, I understand the position where they are. Their job, like everything else in our system, uh, is to return a dollar for their investors. Now, when the companies can begin to say, how do we make a profit as well as protect the environment, then I think we're on the right path. I want the power company at the table when it comes to developing solar and EVs, because they have the money, they have the infrastructure, it's their job to help develop this infrastructure. And if we're asking them to do that, then they're going to have to be compensated for that. We have to give our utilities the opportunity to make money in a way that satisfies what their customers really want and begin to shift them away from that addiction to rate basing and building big power plants. And it is an addiction. They're addicted to it because Wall Street encourages it. They make a lot of money off of it. And when that's how they meet their quarterly earnings targets, that's what they're gonna do. Georgia is an interesting case history. In Georgia, the Army has three major military bases. We were looking for locations to put renewable energy. At the same time, Georgia Power was decommissioning 15 of their coal-fired power plants. And so they were looking for their next generation power source. So once the utilities understood that there was an opportunity for them, they really stepped up. Pentagon said, Commissioner, we want to make Georgia the model state for the Army in renewable energy. They wanted 30 megawatts of solar power at Fort Benning, 30 megawatts at Fort Gordon, 30 megawatts at Fort Stewart. Then what happened? The Navy comes forth and said, we want 30 megawatts of solar power for the submarine base. Then the Marines at the Logistics Center in Albany, Georgia, said they want 31 megawatts of solar power there. Now we are today working with Robbins Air Force Base on 139 megawatts. One essential ingredient for our success there was the strength of the partnership. In the event of a grid outage, Georgia Power would sell that power directly to us. So they installed smart inverters so that when the power goes down in the rest of Georgia, that power will be channeled into our installation. These military projects are owned by Georgia Power. It's done in a way that benefits all customers. The energy from those facilities flows back to the grid so that all Georgia Power customers get to benefit from that long-term price certainty and, and the, the other benefits that come along with solar. The other thing is the Army had the land, so they didn't have to do eminent domain and disrupt the local community. We have land that's buffer between Army activities and the community. Why not put it to productive use? We have what's called in the utility business, the avoided cost. In other words, this is what it costs you to produce that kilowatt of electricity. And in Georgia, in our solar production thus far, with no state subsidies and no upward pressure on our rate payers, are coming in below avoided cost of what we're paying for power today. There's more solar on Department of Defense installations in Georgia than any other state, including California. Let me make it clear to my fellow Republicans, we did not subsidize this. And the way that we've done this has caused rates to decrease, decrease. That is what Republicans want to hear.
future of the grid will be one in which we see fewer and fewer large power plants and more and more houses that are providing their own energy that also have electric vehicles plugged into the garage. Well, that takes the utility completely out of the loop. So either you transform and adapt or get out of the way. If a utility partners with automotive, then all of a sudden you have mobile energy storage. And if you have vehicle to grid communications, now the utility has a new market. Electric vehicles are frankly, one of the only areas of load growth right now for utilities across this country. In other words, that's one of the only ways that their system is actually experiencing increased usage. No question about it, the electric industry is changing and Georgia Power is no different. We're experiencing a lot of the same trends that are happening nationwide. Our loads are not growing as much as they used to. Our revenues are flatter and we're modernizing our business to try to reduce costs, become as efficient as we can. We also have a focus on off-road electric transportation, which includes electric cranes at the Ports Authority. We've got the tugs that move luggage down at the airport, along with forklifts. And so we've got a heavy emphasis across the board of electrifying the transportation infrastructure. We actually will partner with equipment manufacturers and loan out vehicles or different end uses that are electric and let them test those and really get a feel for them over a matter of weeks to figure out how they can transform their business. We need to be able to come up with policies that will increase the number of people that use the vehicles and that give the proper incentives you know, to the power company to want to spend their own money building the infrastructure. And these folks need to strategize together if they want to have dominance in the electric vehicle market. There is a narrative in the United States that says, ah, but nobody like us can innovate. And there may have been periods of time in the last 50 years or so where that was at least partially true. It isn't true anymore. The Chinese will fill the gap. They see the future very clearly, and they're seriously looking at being the world's leaders in these areas. Arguably, they already are in wind and solar, so we have to compete, or we will get overrun, and we're running short on time. It has been difficult to get people to make this shift. People, especially here in the South, they do love their car. They love their F-150. And so while we're focusing on getting individuals to consider electric vehicles, and there's more and more of them offered each year, we are focusing on the big game changers like trucks, over-the-road trucks, delivery trucks, school buses, transit buses. These are vehicles that run many hours a day that are the biggest polluters. We're working on a total of about 12 different electric vehicle types that are designed to go to fleet customers. Fleet customers today want EVs for one simple reason. They have substantially lower operating costs. We're at an inflection point with the electric vehicles. The electric utilities clearly have to be part of that transformation and their key role is to put in the electric charging infrastructure and to make sure that they have capacity on hand to handle that. How is my favorite commissioner doing? <laughs> have you ever been here before? I have not. You're going to be impressed. Good to see you, sir. Welcome back to Green for You. Looks like the plan's coming together, isn't it? It's all coming together. We have our first product in the marketplace. Last year, there were 29 million vehicles made in China. But importantly, 40% of those vehicles were made by companies that didn't exist 20 years ago. 
And the carbon fiber process too is... Carbon fiber, that's another way of light weighting. All of the vehicles starting with our light duty SUV up to these heavy duty SUVs basically use the same chassis. I don't have to worry about oil changes, no spark plugs, no timing belts to break, no transmission to go out. All of those things that break on regular gasoline cars are not in this car. It's not just the fact that you're getting rid of having to buy fuel, you also don't have to do any maintenance to it. And you cannot beat an electric car off the line. You, we have 100% torque from zero. Now, for the first time in history, Renewable energy is the cheap option. And as soon as solar plus storage and wind plus storage is the same cost or cheaper than every other source like gas and coal and nuclear, then why would we choose anything else? There's two ways that you can think about batteries if you're a utility. They could terrify you, or you could see them as an opportunity to own them, to facilitate them, to earn money off of them. There's nothing really stopping a utility from being the one to provide that battery storage to its customers. There's nothing stopping a utility from making the proposal to its Public Utilities Commission to say, hey, we'd like to make money off of providing battery storage to all of our customers. And of course, battery storage is the very best kind of responsive, flexible resource that utilities like. If a utility suddenly has a spike in demand and they need to ramp up production, if they're trying to ramp up from a coal-fired power plant, it's gonna take a couple hours. If they're trying to ramp up from a natural gas-fired power plant, it's gonna take a couple of minutes. If they're trying to ramp up from a battery storage, it's gonna take a couple milliseconds. It's instantaneous. It's such a superior technology, we're gonna turn the corner so fast it'll make people's heads spin. If the utility industry and the automotive industry don't work well together, what you're going to see is the emergence of third parties. You're already seeing Google enter the automotive industry. And could Google enter the utility industry as well? I mean, where there is a void, someone's going to step in to fill the void. The investor-owned utilities of this nation, they've got to protect their investors. They've got to have the visionaries on their boards, on their staff, to understand what impact the electric vehicle is going to have, what impact solar energy is going to have, wind energy is going to have, what impact is continuation of, of fracking going to have. Are we going to be able to continue fracking all the time, or some of these lawsuits going to dispel fracking? The question is, if you're an oil man, for example, what is your future? Fossil fuels have to come out of the energy mix. How are you going to respond? Do we continue to merge around a smaller and smaller industry and eventually the last person in the room turns out the light? Or do we transform ourselves into something else? Do we transform ourselves into renewable energy companies? Do we transform ourselves into carbon management companies? If carbon dioxide has to come out of the atmosphere, oil companies could be good candidates for the ones that need to do it. The oil industry is really largely unregulated, so Unlike the electric industry, which can be transitioned from a regulatory standpoint and I think could have a soft landing, the oil industry is, I think, a lot more vulnerable to that sort of crash landing. 
And so it's going to be up to the shareholders of these oil companies to say, what are we going to do to pivot? There's kind of an obvious solution for gas stations is turn them all into charging stations. They already got covers, so make all of that solar. They're all connected to the grid already. Change is hard, and large complex systems are particularly hard, but all the pieces are in place. It's available, we know how to do it. We just have to figure out how to manage that change at an institutional level without putting lots of businesses at risk of having stranded assets, because those businesses will suffer, the investors in those businesses will suffer, and the workers in those industries will suffer. I have been in the solar consulting industry since 2008. We do installations now in a day to two days tops. My sales are all from referrals. I do not knock on doors. I don't do any of those things, all referrals. I've lived in Pebble Creek since 2001. moved from Tennessee to uh, Arizona. For the most part, it's a very conservative community. So when I began advocating solar electric, uh, I was concerned that it might be a partisan issue. It is not a political issue. It is apolitical. Hey, Charlie. How are you? I am terrific. We're into your hood. <laughs> you really are. <laughs> and I yeah. got to tell you. So this... what is... The whole now, area guys. has a ton of uh, 1,406. So we're officially at 1,406 solar energy systems yes. on rooftops in on Pebble rooftops Creek. On rooftops in yeah. Pebble Creek. Which is, what, 30%? 30%. Of the entire community. Yes. yes. Ooh, come on in. Good to see you. I'm Cher. My husband Mike. Good morning. Welcome. We are here. When I was on the commission, we established the policies like net metering and the renewable energy standard that really led to the boom of solar in Arizona. Believe it or not, it was an all Republican commission at the time. And we actually believed that, that people would go solar. You know, I'm curious as a former commissioner, why you initially decided to do it. If I can save $2,2200 a year, yeah. why would I not do that? Particularly on fixed incomes. My first Arizona summer electric bill. I'd never seen a $400 monthly electric bill, and I was scandalized by that amount. <laughs> it's free. It's, it's sun. It's a win-win-win. You know, win, win. There are no downsides. Let's, let's look in using that. If we can scatter the creation of electricity throughout a neighborhood, we don't have to build a giant plant right out here in the desert that burns coal and fouls the air of the Grand Canyon and requires transmission lines to get the power back into town. I think of the utility companies as the bully. For all of us around here, we want solar for the right reasons. It's the right thing to do for us, for the environment, for our neighbors, for the country. And then you're fighting the people that are doing it for greed. And it ticks me off. If we don't get our act together and start utilizing the technologies that are available to us now, we are going to be, the United States is going to be left in the dust. Technologies we invented. Yes, that we invented. We are going to be left in the dust. There's virtually no one that is opposed to solar. Now that differs from our elected officials who think that they need to be anti-solar, but they're going against their constituents when they say that. Can you give us an update about the tax credit or any bills that impact electric vehicles? All new build residential has to be EV ready just making the business case, we're going to literally drive traffic to your establishments uh, to rent in your units if you can provide EV spaces. The market is demanding this. And that's why the commissioners need to understand electric vehicles. They need to be driving electric vehicles. I've been criticized a little bit by my own party for wanting to subsidize electric vehicles. 
or to give solar more value. There are benefits to a tax credit, for example, for electric cars. Uh, Georgia was second only to California before we removed our tax credit. So when the legislature eliminated it, electric car sales began to skid in our state, dropped 95%, as a matter of fact. Solar is not something that only tree huggers like. What is more conservative than generating your own electricity and not being dependent on someone else to do it for you? Just because they're conservative doesn't mean they can't embrace electric cars or like not having to be beholden to whatever the utility decides they want to charge them. There's a while where when I first came out to North Carolina and I was racing and I wanted to fit in. And at some point I just realized I'm so different from so many people in the garage that I sort of gave up on fitting in. I will have hit 70,000 miles by the time I get home on the Tesla. I mean, think of how much money I've saved in gas over 70,000 miles. Without the race car, the demographic of people that I would be able to reach would be so much smaller if I was just still a biology scientist. I can't expect NASCAR fans to show up at a clean energy conference in Aspen. You know, it's not gonna happen. They're not gonna come to the environmental film festival. It's sort of like I'm on these two sides and I'm balancing these two worlds and I don't fit in completely on either side, but I get to see both of those audiences talking to me as one of them. And there is so much more that we share than what divides us. Put it on a moral foundation. Everyone has a right to clean water, to toxic free air. When we talk about many of the environmental injustice issues, this is the civil rights issue of our time. To take care and protect my creation. We will stand as one united force. And we as human beings who've been charged with being stewards of a planet that has been given to us that was perfectly balanced in terms of water, in terms of air, and we have been destructive and we have neglected our moral responsibility in doing what's so necessary so that not the next generation, this generation can have a more sustainable way of life. So therefore, we have an obligation to fight. We will not bend, we will not break, and we will not bow down.
I'm Claire McGowan, Dominican Sister of Peace and Executive Director Emerita of New Pioneers. I'm learning how to say that word. It's my joy to serve as moderator of this part of our forum tonight, um, following this really powerful film we all just experienced. We have an excellent panel with us tonight to begin to unpack some of the meaning of this film, especially as it might apply to us in our own rural area here. So we'll spend the next 15 minutes with the panel, each of them with five minutes, and then we'll open up to a broader conversation with our audience. Um, we have every intention of ending by 8.30, because we know that for many of you, tomorrow is a work day. Our first panelist tonight is the executive director from Frankfurt, the executive director of Kentucky Conservation Committee, one of Kentucky's oldest environmental advocacy organizations, founded in 1975. You may have met um, Lane before at one of our Springfield Green Festivals because she has represented KCC at a booth at the last three of our um, Springfield Green Festivals. KCC works without charge to represent the citizens and the conservation organizations, um, the, the environmental issues, to the Kentucky State Legislature in particular. So they represent us um, in, around environmental concerns. Lane also serves on the boards of several national environmental organizations. Our second panelist is local author and photographer, Frank Mazur. Frank has published four novels and a collection of short stories, and he's also a respected photographer. His friend Ann Harrison tells me that Frank is also a skilled builder of stone walls <laughs> on the land that he and his wife Joan carefully steward here in Willisburg, just north of Springfield. Frank has taught English over the years. He's worked in the advertising field, and he has a strong interest in social media as well. And last, but not by any means least, is Springfield's own Jackie Reddick Roberts. Jackie graduated from St. Dominic School, and then from Washington County High School, and then decided that she wanted to see the world before finishing college. So she went off to Ecuador, <coughs> and there she met her husband. Through the years, they lived in seven different countries while raising a large family. Recently, Jackie moved back to Springfield to be close to her elderly mom, and she's enjoying Kentucky very much because now she's seeing it with fresh eyes. So as, as you can tell, we're very privileged to have this wonderful panel. And without further ado, I'll ask Lane to begin. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out, and thank you so much, uh, Claire, for uh, hosting us for this event. Um, we've been at Kentucky Conservation Committee. We've been trying to get this film around the state just to help people understand what's happening right now with the electrical grid nationwide and also uh, the controversy that you see um, between citizens and the utilities. This has also been happening in Frankfurt for the last several years. This year, the legislature passed a bill that is going to allow the Public Service Commission to set new rates for how solar is, is charged or how you receive credit for solar. So we want to get the word out so that people understand that, that the Public Service Commission is currently looking for input on that. Um, they're uh, asking for public comments until October 15th. And Claire will have some information about how you can comment, but you can also find information on our website, kyconservation.org. But the, basically the controversy is, is, you know, who's going to own the solar in the future? Is it going to be the utilities? Is it going to be individual residents? Is it going to be a mixture of both or community solar? And that question isn't really settled, 
but the citizens have a say and an interest and so I think the most important thing I can tell people in this film is first make sure you're registered to vote or you're engaged in the conversation so that we know what everyone's concerns are and especially for new pioneers you know we, we'd really like to hear more from the rural communities because I think the greatest advantage of some of this distributed solar is to the farm uh, communities and to um, households in farm communities. There's actually quite a lot of really wonderful grants that are out there right now through USDA and other entities that will support farms and farm communities adapt more solar. Um, I just got my solar this year and I love it. And uh, you can find out information from the grants from your county extension agent or you can also go to uh, MESA, um, which is an organization that works out of Berea. That <coughs> they're, um, Mountain Association for uh, Community, Community Development. Development. Yes, and they, they are getting more and more information about new grants all the time. So we want to bring this issue to your attention. Hope that we can get some comments generated to let people know that this is happening. And if the credits change too drastically for how residential solar is, is credited, and you saw in the controversy in the film how that's playing out, um, then it may slow down the growth of solar in rural communities and residential. So we want to just get that word out. Let folks know that not only is this technology cheaper, cleaner, and the future, the utilities just have to learn how to adapt. Uh, it's very doable, it's just a matter of political will. Thank you, Lane. Mm -hmm. Frank? I uh, I watched the film actually a few times. Uh, I watched the film a few times before uh, this evening, and uh, along with some of the things that were said, uh, for Claire, that this is a small community. What is our part in in, in even trying to push uh, solar a little further? Uh, that's where I was trying to come from uh, in thinking about all this. <clears throat> and one of this is I think is self sufficiency. Whether we talk to this to ourselves to neighbors or to friends. It's an American trait that we like to be self-sufficient and as was pointed out several times in the film, uh, people like the idea of generating their own power, of being responsible for it and not being beholden to a large power company to get it. So I think you know that's part of the thing that uh, it just as an individual you can convey in talking to other people, whatever their political leanings, whatever their thoughts, that it's a nice, clean, simple thing that you have some control over. <coughs> The other thing that I uh, really uh, took notice of, though, too, and uh, what is, they're saying that the, the, the decline of the uh, fossil fuel industries is inevitable. Well, that's probably very true, but we have to push it along because if it becomes inevitable at a certain time, it, we may be, you know, past the tipping point, it'll be a hollow victory. And so, again, it's trying to push things a little further. Now, one of the, one of the items in the story, in the film, that I thought was... Uh, really has import for all of us is the idea of the electric vehicle. How many of you, any of you own an electric vehicle? Okay. <laughs> How many of you have ridden or driven an electrical vehicle? Okay, a few of you. I think a lot of people haven't, and I, even the majority right here, I have never been in an electric vehicle that I recall. And I think that's something that uh, could be pushed in, even in small areas like this. I was thinking that we have, even though I'm not here in the summer, there are summer festivals and it might be good to issue a few invitations to some car dealers who are looking to expand their, uh, you know, their market who sell uh, ve electric vehicles, invite them here, I don't know, for a test drive, you know, to give test drives to people, uh, to explain everything to them, uh, you know, to give them a coupon if they want to buy but just to get more people interested and get them inside a vehicle, let them, let them, you know, feel what it like it is like to ride one, to drive one, to sound, you know, what it sounds like in one. That they're got to be a little more careful crossing the street, even in front of the one. So I think there's a, a lot to be said along those lines. <coughs> the other thing I was going to make uh, a point about too is that the. Uh, is making this very personal, personal of, of wanting solar and wanting to get away from fossil fuels. And by that I mean, and this, this may seem kind of uh, 
you know, petty in a sense or small, but I kind of mean it. In my own garage, and I probably in some years, I must have a half dozen fuel containers. From time to time, I have to take all those fuel containers, I load them up on the old tundra, I drive down to a uh, fueling station, I fill up all those containers, I take them off the truck, fill them all up, put them back on the truck, take them off, take them off the truck, put them back in the garage and use them for time. I would just as soon not do that. I hate doing that. <laughs> so, in addition to all of that, if I look around my garage on every shelf, there are all kinds of products and all those products are oil-based uh, products that, you know, for the car, for the motorcycles, for the lawnmower, for the tractor. <laughs> Frankly, I wouldn't mind getting rid of those too. And, uh, but that's what I mean as far as trying to decide, uh, you know, would you like to make your life a little more, uh, you know, simple, uh, clean up with some of these things? Uh, and it's just a, you know, a concern or a consideration that you, you know, might want to think about. <clears throat> And in the uh, one other thing that I wanted to make note of too was in the it was in the story already here it's been repeated is in voting for uh, or getting you know, voting or making known who you would like in your legislature who you would like on uh, public uh, utility commissions is to do your homework to study the issues but then study the people to find those who are in line with your view on things and to try and work hard. And you know, talk it up to get those people wine. The uh, there's a, a one fellow in the comments said that nobody is opposed to solar. Every, everybody seems to approve of it, and yet there are our our our, our, our bodies of uh, uh, legislators, uh, you know, small small towns, big towns, who are kind of opposed to it, are doing what their constituencies want. And of course, that implies a lot of different things, and none of them are really good. So for that reason alone, like I said, pay attention uh, to who is running, find out if they align themselves with your views on the matter, and go after that. Okay? Great. Thank you, Frank. Sure. Jackie? You, no, you don't have to just tell us. Um, I, I never thought I'd move back to Kentucky. I never did. I would visit once in a while to visit my parents. But uh, moving back here really did something really beautiful to my soul. And I think that people here do not realize what they have. There is, there's something beautiful about this place, not just the way Central Kentucky looks, but the way the people are, and the, the kindness, and the gentleness, and the, the willingness to help no matter what. And I just, um, I think in coming back, you know, there are a lot of things that I, I guess I fear are going to be lost if we, we are not willing to fight for those things for our children and for the next generations. And that is really got to do with the land and uh, the environment. And, and that would be such a great loss um, because of the way it is. And I'm sure anybody that's lived here for a while, maybe it seems really boring to you and everything like that. I know growing up here seemed extremely boring to me. But, but when you come back, you realize what, a, what the heart is here. And I think for me, that is the one thing that makes me want to fight for, for the next generation and for the generations to come. I think one of the most inspiring things that happened to me this uh, last month, besides seeing this video and the various things, is opening up the KU bill for my mom and seeing that Maker's Mark had gone solar. I don't know if anybody knows that, but I thought that was actually quite cool. And that it made, and that KU was saying, you know, that they were helping in that. I thought, but this is something that can happen. This is something that can happen here. And um, I lived in Georgia for a couple years before I came here because my daughter was getting a master's degree, so I went to help. And um, it was very interesting to hear all of this because I didn't even know that it was going on. But um, to see how Georgia is making progress. But one of the things that I don't, for anybody that saw the video, I don't know if you felt so slightly terrified or slightly, uh, I don't know, disarmed is that how far, how easy it would be to completely break down the grid. And we're not talking about a 24 hour breakdown. I lived in foreign countries where the electricity would go out for three or four days. And that's not a joke. That's, that is where you're starting to panic a little bit because you can't cook, you can't do this. We lived in, a, in the country sometimes, so you do a wood fire on a grill and you'd make it, but we're talking about cities 
that would literally not have electricity or water. Everything would just go down. And I think that it's time for Americans to realize how serious it is, how serious it is and to really start going forward with this. And um, like take serious steps and not just waiting down 10 years because we don't have 10 years to do this. Um, so that is one of the things that has was, and really hit me quite a bit. I think if the military is preparing for it, you can rest assured they are miles ahead on what we are thinking and how much that needs to be done. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention about the, the military, oh, I saw an, a, uh, another documentary not that long ago. It was, an, with an, it was an interview with a Navy admiral, and he was saying how they're having to rethink their naval bases because the oceans are rising that things are changing. So we really don't have, I don't think, you know, 20 years to figure this out. We need to make steps now. Um, and then I guess the other thing is I wanted to say, I just said that sometimes we believe that the environment is more like, we see it as more as a partisan issue. But I believe if we do not start really banding together, no matter what, what our, uh, you know, if we're Democrat, Republican, or Independent, if we do not start doing this, it will not be a partisan issue anymore. It will become a humanitarian issue where we're dealing with our future and our children's futures. And for me, that is, that is imperative, and I know it is, because I know that more than anything else, all of us can say that we love our children and our families, and we want to make things right for them. And so anyway, that's, that's what I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lane. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Jackie. So at this point, what we want to do is open the conversation up to the audience and um, exchange uh, with the panel um, or with one another, however you would like to do that. Uh, yes, sir. like a comment on that. I think what you're seeing there is more the influence of the existing fossil fuel industry because it's a pretty major shift um, and you know when you're an industry that is already very rich and powerful you can hire a lot of lobbyists you can have quite a lot of influence on your legislature. Um, when we were working on the solar bill for the last several years we, we've been working on different solar bills for the last five years. Um, this past year we had Three nonprofit lobbyists and one uh, contract lobbyist uh, on the solar side, up against about 25 to 30 paid utility and oil and gas lobbyists. So that influence trickles down to your legislator and can make a real difference. <laughs> Anyone else? Ian? And the pipeline was, it was the work of the Dominican sisters and the Loretto sisters and the Nazareth sisters and many, many other very strong groups and individuals. Everybody worked together on that over the course of a year and a half. Um, so it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy, but it is possible to win. And I can't say enough about <clears throat> the impression of having people go up to Frankfurt because legislators do listen when they see 
five people come in on the same day on the same matter that does get their attention or they get ten phone calls in the same day they know something's up um, but you know people have busy lives and they it's hard for them to go up to Frankfurt and that's where paid lobbyists have an advantage so uh, I certainly even even ourselves as a nonprofit there's no way physically we could have been around as much as the contract lobbyists and it's a it's a very well established industry the the oil industry um, right now there's basically a a dynamic where coal is going away and something's going to take its place and it could be solar and it could be gas and gas actually has an advantage right now because it it so resembles the way the oil industry worked and so it's it's an easier retrofit for the utilities um, to make that kind of transition or the, or the coal industry um, so so we've got a little bit of a challenge the technology works utilities understand that because they're going solar too um, but right now they are working in the traditional model where they own it all and it's really not necessary anymore if you if you believe in market forces I go, I go back again to this electric vehicle that if uh, you know if the population of this country really doubles or triples with an interest in that electric vehicle <coughs> that's going to be forced I think you know some action on the part of these utility companies because they want to want to get into the action too but the one uh, there was a one comment through the movie that said uh, you know if they're not doing what you want demand it well the only demand that's really going to count I think is this kind of actual demand that these cars are out there they need uh, you know uh, power uh, charging stations and if they're not there, like I said, somebody else is going to fill the gap. And uh, the utilities well, love electric cars; they love it. It's the one growth area that they have yeah. right now. Um, states like Arizona have like about 360 days a year that are sunny, mm -hmm. and but the economy is very different in Arizona than it is here. I mean, how do we? Well, what, what route do we take to convince people in the legislature that that's the way we need to be going? Well, unfortunately, uh, when this debate happened in Frankfurt, it was, it was framed as uh, rich solar owners, um, wealthy people. But the prices dropped so significantly. I, I live in Cardinal Valley, which is a lower income neighborhood in Lexington. It's about 30% Hispanic migrant workers. And uh, I have the first solar installation in that neighborhood. And when I had a price this year, I was shocked at how affordable it, it had become, even from just a couple of years ago. So I had them installed three months ago. Didn't have a whole lot of panels because I just didn't have the roof space. But already in three months, I got my first negative bill. I only had to pay the, the basic surcharge, which was $16. Can I interject something on that? Though? Just now, it's my it's my understanding, though, <clears throat> within I don't know the past month or so, that that uh, one of the tariffs out there is on the uh, uh, panels that come from Japan. That they are a big major supplier, and so these tariffs have been put on them, and and as a result, that price is going up, and it's more competitive now with uh, American ones. But the, there's no price drop. In other words. Uh, if you had a choice before of buying a cheap panel, you don't now. So, well, uh, are your, actually, do you know where your panels are made? Well, actually, there's a couple of things going on. First off, the the utility, the the solar providers that I've worked with, which we had several companies that we worked with uh, on the legislation, partnered with them. They they purchased in anticipation of the tariffs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and also there's there's been some programs adopted in different cities. There's one in Lexington. Um, that's a bulk purchase buying program the city signed on to. It's called Solarize. So the city endorsed one vendor to be a bulk purchase supplier and that allowed uh, all customers who wanted to have solar installed um, to save 15% if they agreed to all purchase together. And so there's ways to get around that. And the Solarize program is endorsed by the U.S. Department of Energy and it, it exists in many states but just one city here so far. Kim? Um, we just got uh, solar panels, 30 panels on the house of lights in the very near yep. Valley, where you are. Yeah. And uh, the thing about it is, you're paying, you're paying a monthly utility bill, and if you just look at it as saying, well, I'm not paying that utility bill anymore, I'm buying solar panels. So in 10 to 12 years, it's a 
we right. would just look at it as a long-term investment of not, we just got a negative bill or a balance bill. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty a lot of people look at it as a way to stabilize their price when they go on fixed income. Uh, now the problem, the problem is, and, and the panels are good for 25 plus years, but the problem is now the new law uh, has allowed the Public Service Commission to change that if they want, and the Public Service Commission is looking at that right now. So that's why it's very important for people to, um, like I said, Claire has a handout on this and we have it on our website, but look at uh, what you can comment to the Public Service Commission. Lana will bring the, pan, the um, handout around. But it's a short timeline. It's October 15th is the deadline. So yeah. if you're interested in trying to get your voice heard on this issue, it has to be done in the next two weeks. And, and it's for solar customers and non-solar customers. One of the arguments that was used was that, that the lobbyists were able to convince lawmakers that by my my, my house having solar, it was a burden to non-solar customers, and that's really not the case. So it'd be good to hear from both both solar and non-solar customers. What's the argument for them saying that? Well, um, basically, uh, they were saying that I'm not paying my fair share of the grid. What we're trying to say is we're actually helping reduce our neighbor's cost, really, because we're taking off the peak load. And peak load is a higher cost. So it could actually save neighbors money if we have enough people doing it. I had a question here when, just when we were sitting there, and maybe you could ask. If you build a new home, it's out in the middle of nowhere, do you, is there a, do you have to be connected to the grid? No, you can be on batteries, but the price is still going down on those. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I didn't quite hear all that. I'm getting ready to build a new home. What was that? You, you can be on batteries, but, but right now it's more affordable to be grid tied. I'll probably switch to batteries in a few years. The price keeps dropping. Could you elaborate on that USDA funding? Yeah, uh, actually, um, I'm not the expert on that, but if you go to, to MACED, MACED.org, M-A-C-E-D, um, they are uploading actually some new grant information that they found. Uh, and the USDA should be able to provide you that, but there's more than a couple different grants. So make, Mesa could probably walk you through the different programs available, or your county agent, if you ask. Uh, what are the differences between Arizona and Kentucky, in addition to the alleged difference in sunshine, is that Arizona has a law that requires the utilities to use wind and solar for a specified fraction of their generation by a specified date. We have never done that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the coal industry up until recently really had quite a lot of influence on the legislature. So anything that that resembled um, a jeopardy to coal was uh, usually um, dispensed with quickly in the legislature. But well, one thing I learned from the pipeline struggle mm -hmm. is that every legislator at the beginning of the session, which is only 60 days in Kentucky, yeah. one year, and the other year, the alternating year, only 30 days. There are 250 bills on the average that come to those legislators, and all each of them is this thick. So they can't absorb all that information. Wow. No. And they don't have resources to get the information except the lobbyists. So the lobbyists tell them this is, you know, this is why this is the best way to go. And the citizens are not there to say, oh no, we don't want it that way, we want it this way. So to the extent that the citizens get to their legislators with short, simple, clear information, we have a much better chance of getting their attention and possibly getting them to vote in the direction that we want. It isn't only who's got the most money and who's... Um, you know, who's bought off. Mm -hmm. It's also that we don't do our part to educate them. And not, of course, not any, most people can't go to the legislature very often at all. But if we were more conscious of our role in this process, I think we would get better results. It's my understanding, well, at, at this point, before January 1st, 30% tax credit 
Yes, there's a federal tax credit, and it, it will not totally go away, but it will um, it will start getting reduced after this year. Right. Next year it drops to 20, and the following year it drops to 10, and then it's eliminated. Right. That's my understanding. The, the panels I bought uh, with the solarized discount, and, and it doesn't take care of all my electricity because I just don't have the roof space, uh, cost me about $11,000 upfront cost, but with the federal discount, it will go down to $8,000. Are there any uh, are there any communities, small, mid-sized communities, who offer a tax break for either uh, you know panels on a new house or on an old house like yours? I mean, I ask that because so many communities, even you know, <clears throat> you become a senior citizen and uh, you can get your bill cut in half in a lot of communities. Uh, why not offer something like that from time to time? It doesn't have to be forever. It could be for. Well, that's why I mentioned the Solarize program. Uh, other cities could, could do the same model that Lexington's done. And that, that resolution was a fairly simple resolution by the council. And then they just endorsed a particular company to be the vendor for the panels. And it worked very nicely. But even if the city of Willisburg or the city of Springfield could afford to give a 5% tax abatement or a 2%, maybe that would help to build some interest in and motivation in more people. In this county, I know of four homes that now have solar. Well, if we could get that to 25 over the next few years, that would be significant progress. And the electric car issue, I think, is a really great issue because I think that technology is so emerging that I, I haven't seen a whole lot of lobbyists go against that yet, so I actually have been able to get some information in front of legislators that um, that weren't up to speed on what was happening with electric cars and road usage tax because electric cars don't use gas. We're currently based on a gas tax. So the legislature has to look at how that has to shift. Mm -hmm. um, but there are some great groups, like there's a nonprofit group in Louisville called Evolve that helps to get chargers established in different parts of the state. And they're all volunteer, but they, they recently put a charger out at Wilderness Trace Solar um, in Danville that is all run on solar. And you can charge for free and it runs off of their sol solar panels. Um, parks, state parks and national parks are a great place that a lot of people in the country are having chargers installed and it mm -hmm. becomes a destination point. Mm -hmm. So you know you can look at seeing if you can get uh, what they call an adopt a charger program installed in your, in your community and that will start bringing electric cars into your community. <laughs> the Springfield City Council had a presentation recently on is there any possibility of using solar on City Hall. Whether that will happen or not, who knows, but it's the beginning of a movement. Um, so I was very pleased to hear that that had happened. And I actually feel for the utilities in some of this because like the film showed they're in a they're in a, an old paradigm an old model that's changed very quickly like a lot of things have in our lives you know how we get our how we how we shop how we get our music how we watch movies today all of that has shifted <clears throat> how things get delivered to our homes um, and I, I consider the utilities one of the last big dinosaurs and since they have a pretty strong hold back by the local governments on, on how they interact in the state, it, it's a little harder to, to encourage change, but not impossible. And certainly change has already happened. Half of the coal-fired power plants in this country have already <clears throat> been retired or are retiring. And they're having to replace in some cases with nothing because people have been efficient. But in other cases, it's getting replaced with solar, and solar is very viable in Kentucky. Um, like I said, I've, I've got a negative bill this past month. I think it's helpful to remember that the investor-owned utility company sells EDKU, um, and Duke, and the third one is, uh, they make their money by getting a return on capitals that they have invis invested in generating capacity. So if they were forced by law to install solar panels, they would be forced to make money on them. And 
Last time I heard, it was 11.5% return on their invested capital. I can't even get 1% return. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and those, are, those are the structures that are going to be hard to change, but not impossible to change. And right now, the one, the one thing that can be changed that's on the table is this, how, how solar is credited in the state, and the Public Service Commission is looking at that right now. I think the Lexington Herald Leader had an editorial, I was out of town when this hit, but it was about um, how the Public Service Commission can fix now what Frankfurt screwed up last year, and it's about that bill. Well, I, I want to really thank you, Lane, yes. and you, Frank, and you, Jackie. This has been a really enlightening conversation. Thank you. And as I come to the end of moderating these moving forward forums, actually this is the 19th one over the years, wow. I just want to say a huge thank you to each of you, to our TV audience, to Gary and to Lana, and to all of our um, members and supporters over these years. These 15 years with New Pioneers have really been the joy of my lifetime. And I've come to love all of you dearly. So with the exceptional leadership I know we can count on from Whitney, may New Pioneers continue to be bold, creative, and courageous in leading Central Kentuckians to ever greater care for our land, our water, our soil, our um, wildlife, and our people. Mother Earth needs and deserves nothing less from us. And I know we can do it. So thank you. Thank you.